Hi, and welcome to the Spotlight series presented by the National Cryptologic Museum. My name is Spencer Allenbaugh, I'm the Collections Manager, and this is Rob Simpson, our Librarian. Hi. So today I'm going to present to you our model of Sig Sally, which you can see right here. Now, Sig Sally is very big, um, but we scaled it down so that it can actually be presented in the museum and right. people can kind of see how it works. Um, now, normally it's about a 50-ton piece of equipment, about 30 racks, and it's, it takes up a lot of power. The chair kind um, of gives you a sense of yeah, uh, and the, the coffee height, mug the right there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it can, yeah, but like you said, it gives you kind of a feel of what it would be like. But essentially, this was the first successful secure voice um, device that was used um, during you know, kind of like near middle to tail end of World War II. Right now. Initially, they did have voice systems to kind of secure or to uh, to code some of the voice messages that they would go through. Um, however, they weren't the best. So both sides were intercepting messages during World War II, and both of them could break those messages fairly easily. Um, but it wasn't until Bell Labs presented their prototype for a device, which was actually codenamed the Green Hornet based on the popular program of the time because of the noise it made, which was a buzzing sound right. similar to how the Green Hornet started. Uh, they presented that to the U.S. The U.S. loved it. They contracted it out. They wanted one of their own. And that's what eventually became Sig Sally. Now, Sig Sally was fairly simple to understand. It's essentially just a white noise. They'd use a they would digitize voice and they would mask it with white noise over top of that to hide it. And they would do that using these little disks right here. So they're actually fair size. They're actually usually about that big. Yeah, that they're round. little here, but yeah, in real life they're not. Little here, but in real life they're not. We actually have one of the, or two of them at the museum that we usually have on display. Now, with those disks, they held about 12 minutes worth of information on them, and you had to have two of them, so one on one and one on the other. The reason they have two right here is while one is working, the other one's being queued up so it's ready. Um, now, with 12 minutes of information, that's not a lot of uh, messages that you can really send. So you have to have two that were copies, one on one and one on the other, to kind of make that work through. Right. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is a very big machine. so. Uh, being that it's big, it could only really be used for high-level communications because it's this wouldn't be something you're just sending a normal message with. Right. Um, and you have to have two copies of these disks or disks at all times to really kind of make it work. Rob, where do you think the first one would have gone? So they were used by at the like you said the highest level, mm -hmm. FDR and Churchill initially, um, and they're big. Uh, so I guess you would probably want them at the White House and at Downing Street. Which you would think. Right. But no, unfortunately, they were so big, and they used up 30 kilowatts worth of power, so unfortunately, they needed an air-conditioned room to even run. So what that meant was they couldn't go to the White House. They couldn't find room. They couldn't do that. So this one actually, the first one actually went to the Pentagon, yeah. and then the other one went in under, under, a, <laughs> under a department store in London. Yeah, Selfridges. So, Selfridges, yep. And so that's how they made that work for the time. But that's how they would do run everything. They would have the secure speech lines just run through each other that way. Um, now, it's, it's interesting because this is the first successful use of secure speech, right. but it had implications for the future. So it, it, we eventually go on to bigger things like uh, vocoders, things like that. Yeah. Even our stews will get up to those as well. Sure. And so this was the start. This was where it all really began, where mm -hmm. they are started using things like this. And it's, it's interesting that you look at it because you can imagine someone sitting in here working on all of that stuff, switching out these turntables, making right. the keying devices, things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cool to have something like that, something so big. Now, we actually do have pieces of it, as we mentioned. We have the disks there, and we yeah. actually have some of the synchronized units. So these disks actually had to be synchronized right. as well. And you can see the clock, I believe, right there. Um, we have the clock. So we actually have the, part, the unit to the clock that went on there as well. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, other than to say, you know, thanks for watching, and we hope you have a great day.